My name is Ryan Snelling, and welcome to Watch Diary. This podcast is cursed. I've recorded so many of these intros this morning. I've already exhausted, and we're 22 seconds into this. So hopefully this is the podcast. I am this far into my cold brew. I started with the full glass, but you know. I just can't seem to get it together. I'm congested. I have no idea why. I didn't go to sleep congested. I haven't been congested for days. I'm annoyed by that. It's August 12th. I don't know. There's no like season changing here in Arizona. So I don't know what the deal is. Maybe I'm getting sick. Who knows? What else? What else is cursed about this podcast? It took me forever to get my lighting and camera situated. So, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you guys have picked up on this, especially if you watch an episode of Watch Diary from beginning to end. You know, Watch Diary is made up of different sections, different videos. Sometimes they're recorded at different times. Sometimes I'll start out and my skin is like maybe this color, but by the end of the episode, it gets super red. And not like because I'm like embarrassed, because the color of the camera changes. Uh, it's very weird. Sometimes I like glow orange and then I'll turn pale white. It's very odd. I don't like it. I don't change my lights. That's what's crazy about it. I don't change anything. But it's just how my camera reads certain information. So I had to mess with that this morning. Uh, what else? I woke up to a text from Brando. I had every intent of waking up and recording with him. He was going to help me do the intro. We were going to review another Indian film. But look, he texted me and said his mic cable is not working. If you've been following along the past couple of weeks, you know that Brando's webcam is also not working. I feel like he's just getting out of work. <laughs> I feel like he's just making up excuses. I can't prove anything because he's 2,000 miles away. But two weeks ago, your webcam goes out. Now your mic cable's out. He doesn't even use the mic cable that much. Have I have I had mic cable problems in my past? Sure. But they're once in a blue moon. They're not from stationary mics like this. When I was a vocalist, probably. Because I'm running around with, you know. The wear and tear on a microphone and a live performance is a lot different than a mic cable that just sits here. Half the time he records with his son's gaming headset, so I think he's just coming up with excuses. I can't prove anything, but Brando's scheming something, and I don't know what it is. Maybe he's starting his own podcast about Indian cinema. I don't know. We'll find out, won't we, when he DMs me and asks me to help him make a podcast logo. Uh, guys... Thank you so much for joining me again. I don't know exactly what this episode is going to be made up yet. Um, you know me. I compile different topics and reviews into an episode of Watch Diary. It's sort of a bulk rollout. And then every now and then I'll do different uh, pieces of content throughout the week. But there's kind of a lot going on. And I didn't realize how much there was going on. You know, me and Brando did have... Uh, every intent to discuss, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. I'm not trying to be funny. I just genuinely can't remember because I want to say something. And then when I watch the movie, it said it a different way. And now I can't remember which one is which, but bah Bahubali or Bahubali. I don't know where the emphasis is supposed to be, but that was a movie recommended to us after we reviewed RRR by you guys. So we did watch part one. And that's going to be inside this podcast because I'm recording that with him tomorrow. But I don't need to tell you all that because that's going to confuse you. Uh, so we have every intent of doing that. I'm going to re definitely review Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. And that's what I'm sitting down to do here today. And then there's another movie coming out. And hopefully it's in this podcast. But if not, it's going to be a separate thing. Emily the Criminal with Aubrey Plaza. It's It looks incredible. I saw a trailer for it a couple of weeks ago. I looked on Rotten Tomatoes, and for some reason it didn't come out on Thursday. Like, I saw Bodies, Bodies, Bodies last night on Thursday night, but Emily the Criminal didn't have a Thursday night, at least where I live, but it's got a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes at the time that I'm recording this. So I think I'm going to be able to see it, and you'll know, I think I'm going to be able to see it in time for this podcast. So maybe this po if this podcast comes out on Sunday, it's because I have seen Emily the Criminal and I'm going to review it, but again, I don't need to go through all that. So... Just keep watching, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, I have... what's that, What else is going on? My lights. I changed my lights. My intent 
was to show Brando that I'm angry. You know how like couples have like that thing where like they'll set like a stuffed animal on a certain place on the couch and that's how you tell your partner that you're horny? <laughs> that's what I'm going to start doing here on the podcast. You're going to know what my mood is depending on what the lights look like. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you which color means horny. <laughs> I did see bodies, bodies, bodies. Um. Anyway, <laughs> follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, TikTok, at Rewatch Ryan. I think I'm already like ready to delete TikTok. I saw something on Joe Rogan where they were talking about the terms and conditions and how like crazy uh, China is about TikTok, about just stealing data. But then again, I'm like, what data do I have that matters? Like, so what if China knows I like the gray man more than most? I don't know. <laughs> so stupid. Anyway, you can find me at Rewatch Ryan on pretty much everything. Letterboxd as well. Letterboxd is where I keep track of uh, how I feel about all the movies throughout the year, but also all of my rankings when I do in every movie ever. I don't think I have a ranking today, so that won't be on the podcast. Um, what do I want to talk about before bodies, bodies, bodies? Uh, I don't have a whole lot prepared, I guess, but here's what I'm noticing lately, and I don't know how long I can talk about this because, again, I don't have this prepped, but I was just thinking about it the other day. And I, I thought about saving it for a live stream, but I'm just going to do it here now. So there's obviously a lot going on with streaming and movie studios. The past couple of weeks, we've been hearing a, especially a lot about HBO Max and Warner Brothers, but also like some Disney Plus stuff, some Netflix stuff. And there's always a certain amount of outrage there's a certain amount of complaints by fans what when any news comes out about a streaming service or a studio of course there's the side that benefits from said news but there's also the side that complains about said news now here's what i've noticed more than ever we have these like seismic shifts in the studio system and streaming system but every time a story comes out I read it as if it's something that's in favor of me or it's in favor of the fans or audiences of said things. But there's still complaints and I don't really get it. And I kind of talked about this on the last live stream that I did talking about the Warner Brothers canceling Batgirl. But ultimately, what's happening is a lot of news that is works in our favor. And we're still complaining about it. So let me let me just discuss. So everything going on with Netflix lately. The fact that Netflix is failing is good. It's good for Netflix. It's good for us. Because what have we been talking about on this YouTube channel since Sight and Sound? Since me and Jay. We talked about how Netflix just has this compiling attitude. Netflix is a compiler. More than anything. Sometimes they make us think that they're in the prestige television game. And every now and then they do have a huge water cooler hit. But for the most part, they just shit stuff out. It's a copy and paste cookie cutter algorithm. And I understand that different people like different things. And I understand that there are different audiences than say how I... There are people who view things completely different than how I view them. But ultimately, we're talking about survival in the streaming wars and you can't be dominant if you're just compiling content and overwhelming people with content that they don't know about um that isn't promoted you can't keep green lighting shows just to cancel after one season it this stuff is just constantly working against Netflix and they they did so little to prepare for the fact that they are losing rights to things left and right they they didn't do enough to prepare for those days for the dark days where they don't have friends where they don't have breaking bad one day where they don't have the office they didn't do enough they didn't do enough quality control with their movies i am sitting here right now recording this instead of watching day shift on Netflix, the Jamie Foxx vampire movie. I started it and I got about 30 minutes in and realized it is not worthy of my time or this podcast. 
So here I am talking about this. Um, they didn't do enough um, quality control all these years. So now they are losing subscribers and people are doubting them and they're having to make changes and make shifts. And that is a good thing. It's a good thing. Because I feel like they're going to figure it out and they're going to be better than ever. And they're going to call an audible and they're going to maybe implement this, implement that. And maybe it won't be perfect. They're going to make mistakes. You know, I read uh, the other day that 1% of Netflix subscribers, I, if I remember correctly, 1% of Netflix subscribers have utilized the gaming function on Netflix. Now, am I one of those 1%? No, because I'm not going to lie. I totally forgot that that was a thing. I haven't read about it. I haven't heard anybody talking about it. The thing, the Netflix news that I heard this past week, they canceled a show. It was a vampire show, which whatever. And I've never heard of it. Nobody in my life has ever talked about it. I just saw that it was trending on Twitter. And I was like, oh, what is this? Turns out it's a show that was on Netflix that has a fandom, but they canceled it after one season. And honestly, that's the problem with making a TV show for so many different audiences. Especially when you don't really know if you're going to keep it. So it's like you you have like all these fringe things that go out with these fringe audiences. and uh, But... I feel like they have to implement a little bit of like the quality control comes in with like, Oh, let's like just focus on the thing that everybody can get into. And how can we make this work for a lot more people and be a little bit more broad? And like, I feel like there's a balance now, you know, if you go too broad, then everything becomes the MCU and becomes Marvel and too people pleasing. And I understand that that's not what I want either, but at the same time, it's just not working. And they're being challenged. Their stock is falling. And I feel like this is going to benefit us in the long run. And we just have to wait and see and wait and figure it out. So the other thing that's going on is with Warner Brothers in DC and HBO Max. And a lot of it has been fluff. You know, there were people that were talking about the end of HBO Max, which I don't even know where that came from. But I don't know. People don't know how things work. Um, but it goes back to the conversation about Batgirl. It goes back to the ongoing conversation about The Flash. The fact that a studio exec just outwardly said, hey, we're going to do, we're going to plan our DC universe for 10 years, and we're going to bring in someone like Kevin Feige to, to head this thing the way that they've done it over at Marvel Studios. David Zaslav, the CEO of Warner Brothers, CEO of Warner Brothers, uh, whatever, whatever his title is. The fact that someone said Kevin Feige's name, called him out by name, and pointed to Disney and Marvel as a a system that works, that's something that we've been screaming at for years. For as long as like Batman v Superman has been a thing, which is what? That came out in 2016. Maybe as far as 2015, seven, eight years, we've been talking... When will DC get their shit together and get a Kevin Feige? We finally have it coming to us. We were told, and we still find things to complain about. We are still applying problems from the previous regime to this current. It's almost like how the presidency was handed over. Like <laughs> when our current president took over, he inherited problems and some people see it as his problem. Some people see it as the previous president's problems. Like, I don't want to get too political, but like, that's just like a natural thing. It doesn't matter if it involves Trump or not, but Warner brothers inherited these problems. So they have to like fix things that they inherited while also implement things moving forward. And we're in that period and fans don't know how to decipher this. They don't know how to put themselves in these positions. So the fact that, like the flash has completely different circumstance and Batgirl. Like, do I entirely understand it? No, but do I understand it to a point? Yeah. They didn't have a PR nightmare to deal with, with Batgirl. It seemed like it was a lot more binary, right? And whether you like the idea of it being a tax write off, but it happens and we didn't see an ounce of footage. So why is everybody upset? Cause it could have been bad. 
and we can still get a Batgirl movie later. Um, but the fact that people are so mad about the Flash, well, it's a completely different thing. Completely. And part of the problem is that Ezra Miller is an absolute nightmare of a human being, and I literally hate his face so much. But you have all this other great stuff, supposedly, in this movie, You and it's so far away, it's a lot harder to figure out what to do. Especially if, like, what if the plan that David Zaslav and the next Kevin Feige, what if everything that they were working on hinged on what was in this movie? What if this movie needs to come out so that they can start the plan that we're going to love? But now they're going back to the drawing board, but people aren't capable of thinking like that. <laughs> or certain people, I should say. Certain people, the ones that complain. Because it's really complicated. Now, do I like, at the end of the day, if Ezra Miller, you know... It hurts more people if this movie doesn't come out than just Ezra Miller. Now, do I want to see him in a movie ever again? No, I do not. But there's, it's more complicated than just taking a movie away from Ezra Miller. Because that's not what you're doing. So... Regardless, my entire point is that I feel like right now, I feel confident that once we shovel through the shit, we're going to get what we want. I truly believe that soon, and it might not be apparent immediately because it, that makes no sense, but soon, in a matter of years, we're going to get a better DC universe. Are the Snyder fans ever going to understand that? No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. But I think we're going to get a better Netflix. I think we're going to get a better Warner Brothers. I saw a stat this morning that supposedly th there's a declining interest in superhero movies. I feel like the MCU is going to be challenged and Marvel is going to be challenged. And they've already heard enough about the Thor, Love, and Thunder backlash and the Multiverse of Madness. I know those things make money, but they know we're thinking differently about their products. They know. The... Controversy going on with uh, the visual effects artists, that's going to work in their favor, I think, eventually. Because they're going to get louder, and then the fans are going to rally, because that's something that's something fans see. Fans hate the visual effects in a lot of these projects. So the fact that visual effects artists are like, yeah, Marvel sucks, we're only going to get louder and rowdier towards Marvel. And again, we're going to challenge these corporations to, to change how they've been doing things. You know, all of this together, I feel like this is good. and uh, But there are still people complaining about the process. And I just don't know why. I don't really get it. Like, I, I get the, you know, I get the, def the initial complaints of, like, standing for the visual effects and complaining about the product. Because they shouldn't just be shitting out product, you know? It goes back to compiling. Us fans want to feel like these corporations care. We want them to feel like they care. And it's a hard truth to realize for the most part they don't. Sometimes it feels like they do. Sometimes maybe they really do. But the fact that like these, they're kind of getting pinned in these, like they're kind of getting pinned in these situations where they have no choice but the do things in our favor. So, do I complain about Batgirl when we have all this other news that we're just moving in a different direction and getting a better DC universe? Are there going to be casualties? Yes. Um, but I think ultimately what these companies are doing is realizing that they have to really put in the work to win these wars and i think they've all seen in different ways that it's about quality over anything so i think we're getting there and it's just a little weird to see like random tweets that are still complaining about bad girl and it's like guys or they'll just make it about something that it's not about sorry i keep shaking my leg and it's just driving me crazy so that's just Again, I didn't really prep that, but I guess to sum it all up, I'm just seeing a lot of news that I think 
is helpful to us. So I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get upset about it. The only thing that makes me mad is Ezra Miller's face. I can't stand. I'm so tired of hearing about Ezra Miller. I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of it. I just want him to go away forever from my life. All right, so I'm excited to talk to you about Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. So excited. If you saw my early out of the theater reaction, you know how I felt. I was gushing about this movie last night. Couldn't stop thinking about it. I texted a whole bunch of people and told them to definitely go see it in theaters. And I'm going to tell you, definitely go check out Bodies, Bodies, Bodies in theaters. Because it was quite the experience. Now, before I saw it though, I didn't know what to make of it. Because A24 horror for me has been hit or miss. I really enjoyed X, but I really hated Men. And when I saw the trailer, I didn't follow a whole lot of the promotional stuff. I saw the trailer like one or two times and... My impression was that I was interested, and I'm sure that it would be topical because it was A24, but I didn't know if it would be for me, just you know, based on the content of the movie. I didn't know if it would be for me. It also reminded me a lot of uh, the movie Spring Breakers, where it was kind of like trying to be horny and hot, and it had the one like high-profile actor in it, and were surrounded by all these young women, and... I remember that movie just kind of being like, it was acclaimed and there was a lot of heat, but also a lot of people like hated that movie and it kind of just like felt flashy for the sake of being flashy. And that's, that's what it reminded me of for better or worse. Um, so I don't know, but if you, if you don't know a whole lot about this movie, I'll read the synopsis from INDB. When a group of rich 20 somethings plan a hurricane party at a remote family mansion, a party game turns deadly in this fresh and funny look at a backstabbing fake friends and one party gone very, very wrong. I'm not going to spoil anything about this movie, by the way, because this is an experience. I'm so glad I was the only person in my row because I probably looked like a psycho. I was throwing my hands over my head and I was squirming. I was putting my feet in the seat. I was moving around and I was feeling the movie i was feeling the tension and feeling the mystery and it was just great it was a great movie to watch with people though i'm also glad i was in the row by myself so i could feel free to react um but it was it was a lot of fun so let's start with the actors so i was excited to see maria bakalova in this movie this is it's kind of from her perspective the movie starts with her and she kind of carries us throughout the entire story because we're meeting uh the rest of the characters the way that she is she doesn't know any of these people uh when she goes to this party so she's our vessel into the story and yes it's a bunch of uh rich chicks and rich guys hanging out together celebrating at this huge mansion and it's a great setting it's a great setting for this movie because you never quite see all of it because a lot of it takes place at night. So there's enough of it to keep you guessing and keep you interested in the geography and the layout of everything. But also it's so limited in what you see. And I think it actually really works to its benefit and adds to the tension in a really, really great way. It's a great setting uh, for this for this movie. So basically you learn that all of them are either friends, have different relationships with each other pete davidson has is uh dating one of them and another one brings in lee pace's character who's like 40 and doesn't really belong at all there either and so there's all these interesting dynamics that are being set up when you go into this movie and maria bakalova does an incredible job she was awesome in borat too uh but she's she's fantastic in this as well but honestly there's a lot of actresses that i've never heard of or never seen before they, everybody does a great job in this movie. Uh, Amanda St- Stenberg plays Sophie, and she's kind of like the main lead. That's uh, who brings Maria Bakalova to this party. But a whole bunch of other no names: Rachel Sennett, uh, Chase Wonders, a, a lot of um, a lot of great young talent that do a great job in this movie. Uh, Lee Pace obviously does a great job as well. Somebody that we're more familiar with, probably, but. Um, but the acting and the writing is sharp and on point and it's real raw and authentic and it just adds to these great character relationships dynamics and uh it it just helps everything so everybody did a really really great job in this movie so what this movie's about and the reason why it proved to me that it could be for me is because first of all it was exciting to watch 
But also, this movie also has a sense of humor about the generation that it's exploring, which are Zoomers. And I honestly, like, I know a lot of Zoomers. <laughs> and the people in this movie talk like the Zoomers that I know. But it also has a sense of humor. And ex it explores um, a lot of the labels and a lot of the terms and a, lo a lot of... Um, what their social media is like and it does a really really great job and it has enough of sense of humor and enough parody of that for me to relate to so it's like i take it completely differently than i'm sure someone who relates to these people does um which is great because it's kind of like for everybody in a way and I, I got enough out of it but somebody else is going to get something completely different and it's awesome uh, there's a conversation about gaslighting that Pete Davidson has uh, with one of the chicks in the movie. And it, it literally, he, he was speaking or I was speaking through him or he was speaking through me because I had this exact conversation with somebody that I know uh, that he has in the movie. And it was, it was fantastic. So there's a great sense of humor and they definitely make fun of their generation. 100% with this movie. Um, the stuff that kind of gets like, not so funny, but it's really interesting too. This movie, uh, Again, there's a, it starts with this game called Bodies, 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 and it's just like a classic game. I've never played it. it. It was new to me, but it sounded like something that was a thing, so you might know what it is. But it's a game about there's a killer, and everybody else has to figure out who the killer is. And that's what they do on this bored, drunken night at this party. And then it comes, because it's a movie, an actual murder mystery. And again, I'm not going to spoil anything, but... What makes this movie so wonderful, and a lot of movies are like this, but for some reason this struck a chord with me because, especially with this generation and where we are in society, is because you they really could make any narrative into an accusation. Because basically this movie it takes place over one night in this mansion. There's no due process. There's no... I don't know. There's not a lot of logical thinking. It's a lot of people grasping at straws to sort of form their truth. And this group of friends really start to betray each other in interesting ways. And again, this formula, it's not unheard of, but there was something just like so real and authentic about it. And it just struck me harder uh, than usual because I, I never, like I said, I never knew what was happening. I never knew where this movie was going. I was constantly excited, so figuring out this movie as all the characters were talking was really, really fun, but it's cr it's crazy to think how anybody can sound like a psychopath if you form the right narrative and the right pieces of their life together. I mean, you can make anybody sound crazy if you just use a little, a few different elements. You can maybe rationalize, unfortunately, if somebody's killed someone or not. Like, it sounds crazy, but... This movie has a lot going on while also being scary, while also being funny. And um, I just had an absolute, I just loved it. I just loved it. There were so many scary moments and intense moments that had me on the edge of my seat. And I just had a lot of fun. I definitely think that uh, as more people see this movie, there will be opinions on the ending for sure. But um I loved it and I think it worked and I kind of think it spoke to and it was in the, I felt like it belonged with everything else that I've said about the movie. I feel like it fits what this was going for. So Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is definitely um, a more favorable horror movie for me, a more favorable A24 movie and it actually rocketed into my top 10. So if you go to my letterbox.com slash rewatch Ryan, you can see that Bodies, Bodies, Bodies went straight into my top 10. And I can't believe how much horror is in my top 10 as of right now. Uh, but yeah, it's crazy. So definitely, definitely check it out. Um, have fun with people. I saw it by myself, but have fun with people. Go take your friends. This is, uh, this is one of those movies. And uh, I hope to be talking about it uh, for the rest of the year. And let me know what you think. If you've seen it, let me know in the comment section down below or tweet at me, whatever you got to do. Let me know what you think. I'd, I'd be really interested to hear how the rest of the world reacts to this. All right. So the last 2022 release I want to review today is Emily the Criminal. This might be the smallest movie that I've covered on this podcast so far this year. It's so unsuspecting. I saw a trailer for it one time. I can't remember what movie it played before, but 
I started looking around at the show times, knowing that it was coming out, and I never could really... Get, it's one of those movies that when you look it up, depending on the site, it's a different release date. I hit my notifications on Cinemark, so they would tell me. And there wasn't a Thursday release. Like, I, I was able to see Bodies, Bodies, Bodies on a Thursday night, but it was only playing in one theater in Tucson, Arizona. So, a metropol a city... In Arizona, only had one theater playing this. So I don't know how long it's going to take for this to go out to the rest of the world. I have no clue. But I have a feeling that I'm going to be talking about a movie that no one has seen. So let this be a recommendation for you. Emily the Criminal is a small movie, but it's currently at 94% on Rotten Tomatoes at the time that I'm recording this. 86% uh, audience score, fewer than 50 verified ratings. It's a small movie. As of right now, but guys, it's awesome. It's awesome. This is Aubrey Plaza Breaking Bad. It's directed by John Patton Ford, who this is his first feature. He only has another uh, short film on his IMDb, but this movie is just truly coming out of nowhere. It's a crime drama. It's a little over an hour and a half. It's short, but sweet. And I'll tell you what, I was hoping to get an American animals type experience with this, just this little, you know, unsuspecting crime drama that would blow me away. American animals for me was like that. This is very similar. It's not as good. I don't think, but it's a very similar movie that just hits you in the nuts. And I wish that this movie looks easy and I know that it's not, but it looks easy in the sense that like, this should just be the baseline quality for every single movie that is made. This these this movie is what we should get all of the time on streaming services. There should always be a little quality film available at any given moment. And there's not. And there's no excuse for it. And there's no reason for it. But this movie... You know, I, I feel like I'm selling it harder than I normally would, but it's just because I see things like this and I could watch movies like this all day. You take an actor who plays against type, you know, I've never seen Aubrey Plaza do, I've never seen her do anything other than what she does in like Funny People or what she does in Parks and Rec. I mean, honestly, like April Ludgate is kind of like how I just assumed Aubrey Plaza was in real life. And I don't know if that's true or not, but this is a role, obviously, where she's playing against type. She's uh, in a lot of debt. She works as a caterer or as a as a food delivery person or as a catering person uh, in L.A. And she's in a lot of debt and is struggling to recover from uh, these misdemeanors of her past. And so all of this kind of comes together to where she feels out of desperation, like she needs to resort to uh, credit card fraud. And all of this is in the trailer, and she meets up with Theo Rossi's character, who plays, I believe, a Lebanese uh, gentleman by the name of Yusuf. And he introduces her into this world, and she, like this kind of story goes, she falls into it and gets in over her head. Uh, you also see her transform as a person. It truly is Aubrey Plaza's uh, Breaking Bad moment here. And I feel like it's going to be um, seen by very few people. But again, I could watch movies like this all day. I love this type of film. Just watch the trailer, and they, that'll show you and give you everything that you need to know about this movie. So like I said, I don't know if this is going to come out. I think the, the direction was very raw and real. It was handheld. Aubrey Plaza, again, made me forget about every other thing that I've ever seen her in. She did a great job. She's easily the best thing about it. Um, and she deserves all the praise in the world. I also noticed that this was uh, produced by her, um, which is kind of nice. And I, I like the idea that hopefully it's like Aubrey Plaza taking her persona into her own hands. And uh, that's the way that it comes across. And I really appreciated it. And I just felt like this movie had to, it feels like it kind of had to fight to get here. And, um, but anyway, the, the work, the script is tight. Um, I, thought there was an authenticity and a believability to it and I just really had a lot of fun like I said I could there should be movies like this all the time uh these types of movies should be on streaming every week and it's crazy that they're not to me um I love that I sought this out um instead of just 
you know, accepting that we have movies like Day Shift on Netflix this week. I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to. So uh, I don't know how hard it is uh, going to be for you to go seek this movie. But if you can find Emily the Criminal, please do so. Because it's wonderfully done. Um, short, sweet. Aubrey Plaza, Breaking Bad. Definitely go check it out. This reminds me of um, last year. I feel like the unsuspecting movie that I was really trying to push was The Night House. So it kind of has those vibes. But even this movie seems like it's going to be, um, I don't know, a much smaller deal than that. But anyway, if you can, please go seek Emily the Criminal. It's um, maybe in my top 10. Maybe. We'll see. Time might change things. But uh, this was definitely one of the best movies I've seen so far this year. As of August 13th. Brando Hall, good morning. Good morning, baby doll. I see you're drinking out of a glass jar, bringing a little Kentucky to Arizona. Yeah, I'm, I've got an Italian roast and made it into cold brew today. So that's what we're working with. I'm not going to tell you this to make you feel guilty. I'm going to try to make you feel better. Yesterday morning, I recorded part of this podcast right after you canceled, and it was some of the worst podcasting of my entire life. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't there. Right, but I'm like, as soon as you like canceled, I didn't know what to do with myself, and I, I recorded the intro portion, so just like the opening few minutes, like seven yeah. times, I recorded my Bodies, Bodies, Bodies review, I think three times. I was just an absolute wreck without you. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Is bodies, bodies, bodies uh, the doc or the uh, biopic about drowning pool? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and I didn't know that going into it, but it is. Wow, it's it's got Pete Davidson in it, right? It does, and it's R.I.P. It's incredible, and I think okay. you will love it when it comes out on VOD. Oh, I can't wait. It's a scream esque. Okay. And so it's a horror movie. It's a horror comedy, yeah. Okay, like uh like an inconvenient truth. Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> I was Al literally Gore. I was literally just about to say, um, it's a crazy like one night of craziness type of movie. It all takes place over one night and um but your inconvenient truth joke kind of ruined it uh, that's oh well. not a, that's not an overnight horror kind of i mean it had to start somewhere yeah so yeah. so just walk me through how you feel about your life and yourself because maybe it's not a big deal <laughs> at all but when you wake up and find yet another thing that um changes my podcasting um schedule how does that make you feel about yourself Oh, I was fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I felt bad that uh, my mic cord didn't work, but uh, I knew I just had to get another mic cord. Now, one of the problems in living where I live is I've got to drive at minimum 25 minutes, 30 minutes to get another kind of mic cord. Did you go to Frankfurt or Lexington? If I was going to go... To just get a mic cable, I would probably go to Frankfurt. I've got friends I could have called and borrowed one. But I didn't think that uh, that you deserved that. Um, and so, no. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was fine. I actually had, yesterday was actually pretty chill. What'd you do? You know? What'd you do well, instead I, of podcast? <laughs> I went to a party. Okay. I went to a party at okay so do you have any groups of friends well any friends at all that play board games um i think there was an era where what do you call it, like D sessions uh that's a board game that's a board game. I, I was trying to come up with another word, like sessions, but it's like a D and D meetup or whatever. That was going on at a particular time with I think like Ryan, Anthony, and Phil. I don't know if they quite do that because they're all kind of scattered everywhere, but that used to be a thing. Okay. I can see Phil doing that. Um 
I so these were like not just board games, but games in general uh, of the board variety, like card games or you know, Cards Against Humanity or any of those kinds of games. Well, I mean, we randomly have game nights and stuff, but you know. Yeah. Okay. So I have never in my life had a group of friends who like to do things like that. And I've found myself with a group of friends who do that once a month. We get together, we bring apps. I brought chicken fingers from Zaxby's, which there's just no canes close by or that's where I would have went. Right. But uh yeah, we go over there and we play these games. And like there's part of me that's like I don't want to do this. This is not me, but it's it's an easy way to meet people while not having to have like awkward conversations. You actually get to know them through the rage and fury of competition, you know. So it, it's weird. I don't understand it because, like, everybody's having, like, Dos Equis and playing board games and card games. And that's what I did instead of, uh, well, after, uh, you know, I should have been podcasting with you. During the time that I should have been podcasting you with you, I was watching anime. How does that make you feel? Um, well, all the girlies that I work with say that anime is a red flag, uh, in all of the men that they talk to and date. I, myself, was just thinking the other day that I need to go see this new Dragon Ball Z movie in theaters. So, I I have mixed feelings. I, I know... If a girl says... I know what it means to be a red flag. Like, anime is kind of a weird thing, I think. Um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Hold on, that's not what I want to say. Anime okay. is not my thing, but also yeah. th- there was the like one uh, breakthrough in Dragon Ball Z that was my thing growing up. Um, so like I get it, but I don't really get it. So yeah. and that's fine, and I get that it's a very popular thing, and I'd be foolish to make fun of or knock something as popular as anime. <laughs> Especially on a podcast that's probably going to reach our international friends quite a bit. Yeah. So uh, I was watching an anime called One Punch Man, and I was just trying to get caught up. Uh, No, to the girls who said that it's a red flag, that's interesting to me because I bet that they are single and (laughs) they are not dating. And they're probably the there is a group of people let's say people in their young 20s or late teens who are just awful and they i don't know if they've been convinced that romance is supposed to be like keeping up with the kardashians but i love that people who are chronically single and have no personality love to like call out things like that now i mean i used to make fun of wrestling you remember in a group chat that we used to have, I would give people so much shit about wrestling. And now I've been watching like there's a there's an Instagram channel called WrestleBotch and it's where all these wrestlers like fail like in big ways. And it's one of my favorite things on the planet. But through this, I have started to also get recommended to me wrestling videos oh i thought you were gonna say you found an appreciation somehow like if you are enjoying are are you talking about when they accidentally like break their act or break character or something or break their arm or like totally miss a move does that somehow cause you to appreciate it more oh yeah one thousand percent so and like i like it in a way of dumb entertainment in the same way that like anime or RRR or you know any of these things are um it's it's when it's done well it's very you know just stupid fun and that's okay now I'm not gonna watch it on TV because you know I've got kids and we don't do that yeah but, I think that like you're speaking to 
something that I've always had a problem with as someone who's been pretty much single his entire life. Like the th- yeah, that's right. The things that I feel like I bring to the table are completely like overlooked. I no, that's what they make me feel like. They make me feel like the things that I bring to the table are so overlooked because they have uh, the women that I've been around. Uh, so I hear them talk about all these like superficial things that they like care about or don't care about while also like they talk about things that they don't care about and it's, and I've always thought they would care about it. So this entire time I'm completely missing what the hell they want at any given time. And it makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's like, and I think part of it too is, uh, well, that's really it. You can't, it's so, just impossible to navigate because they they make it seem like there's no exceptions. Wrestling is actually a great example because when wrestling was at the height of its powers at the late 90s, look, I'm sure there were women that were into it, but it was definitely 100% a mostly male demographic watching the Attitude Era of WWF or WWE. There's no way. Yeah. But I guarantee, like... <laughs> The majority of those men were probably in relationships and they had like supportive <laughs> partners. Yeah. That didn't I would also care. say women back then would have said if they watch wrestling, red flag. So let me tell you what real red flags are. And I use this in life. These are red flags to look out for when you're looking for the future miss or mister or non binary, whatever. Uh, when you're looking for a partner. Okay, red flag number one. How do they talk to the waiter or waitress? Number two, if they get something wrong, how do they respond? If you order a steak, number one, if you order a steak anything more than medium rare or meat, I'll go even medium, then you don't deserve breath. You're, <laughs> you're a waste of life. <laughs> but if you order a steak medium and it comes to you medium rare and you send it back, red flag. Just eat it. What is the big de- And if you flag a waiter, it's over. You're done. Because those kinds of people are terrible. Here's the last well, one. Well, it depends. It depends. But I know what you mean, and I mostly agree, but I think there are some exceptions. And you can politely discuss with the waiter an issue. Or if you go, oh, this is just a little rare for me. Like that's okay, that's that, that's acceptable. I think. But, but if I think I would rather like, I would rather a polite conversation with like, what's wrong and how can we fix it instead of like a guilt trip kind of comment. Yes. Like if the waiter comes over and is like, "How's your food? Well, it's a little dry, but I guess I'll pay for it, or I guess I'll okay. like that is way worse than if- and. If they try to get it cheaper, get out because they're going to do that with everything. Yeah, it's it's fine if like the waiter comes over and he's like, "Hey, how's your food?" and you just want to be like, "Hey, man, like it's really not a big deal. Like it doesn't bother me, but you brought me green beans and I just uh, asked for mac and cheese. It is like, there any way we can get that switched out? I mean, I yeah, feel like that's totally that's cool. Yeah, that's fine. But the guilt trip, like little comment, like. I'm actually allergic to this in 50 states or whatever the fuck. <laughs> <whatever they say. laughs> allergic in 50 states. Yeah. Uh, no, I think how you respond in those moments. Okay, you can send it back once. If it comes back and you send it back and I'm waiting for anything, we're leaving. Well, because yeah. there's now spit in our stuff. And, and I think that's okay. I think, I think it- more people need spit in their stuff. Cause, cause here's the thing, you can't hit anybody anymore. Maybe metaphorically, maybe not literally, but metaphorically, people need more spit in their food. People need to be afraid of how they talk to me. Do you know or how they talk to people? Cause it's just gone. People are more rude now, and they'll be like, "No, she," like people will say, "No, they just know what they want." It's like, no, there's just be a person, be a compassionate human being. And the other thing is what your front lawn looks like. If you own a house and you're supposed to mow the lawn and the, mo- and the lawn looks terrible, get out. Get out of that relationship because everything else in their life 
it's the same adage as like you know a bible that's falling apart is proof of a life that's not well let me tell you how many people i know who have these rickety ass bibles but they life is in the gutter so but i will say like yeah look at the yard how they treat waiters and is there another one in your in your experience what's a red flag well, no, I was just going to say, I was thinking about how much I used to think it was funny whenever I would hear Jay doing yard work. Yeah. Whenever Jay would be like, I have to mow. That would always just be funny to like sit there and imagine Jay mowing. Because I've never <laughs> seen Jay exert energy. Yeah. Now, whenever he would say that he had to do like yard work, it just it made me laugh. Do you have a yard? <laughs> no. Okay. You live in an apartment? I do. Oh, okay, I thought you lived in a house. When you lived with PJ, who mowed that lawn? There are no, there aren't any lawns in Arizona. Who raked the sand? <laughs> I don't know what you do there then. But you don't do anything. It's all like gravel. God, Arizona's hideous. Yeah, there's not really, you can definitely have like artificial grass and like, if it's like a neighborhood, the grass, like the entry way of the neighborhood, like where the, you know, the stone signs of the, you know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. there's grass dressed when it comes to like a, the appearance of the neighborhood, but there are no, when you go inside neighborhoods, it's all gravel rock. So. Well, that got depressing. Um, I said earlier on this podcast without you i was like i'm not gonna stop until netflix only recommends indian cinema that's to me. right yeah <laughs> because my thoughts and feelings towards this are very like complex like it's not just easy to write it off in the same way that it's not easy to call it a masterpiece and i was like making fun of myself while watching because i'm like <laughs> like i'm critiquing it in a way and i'm like i i only have one indian film under my belt and i'm acting like i'm an expert <laughs> in <Hollywood> right, yeah <laughs> while, while i'm watching this so i was kind of laughing at that and and that allowed me Still, I had a sense of humor about myself. I had a sense of humor about the film, and it just allowed me to embrace it and let it wash over me and enjoy it. And we'll talk about whether I enjoyed it more or less in RRR, of course. But, like, if again, if we can kind of just talk about for the viewer. Okay, let me yeah. backtrack even further. So, guys, Brando and I talked about RRR on the channel. And we had a blast, and the conversation was a lot of fun, and we knew we wanted to watch more of these films. A lot of them were recommended by you guys, the viewers, in the comment section, and I greatly appreciate it. Shout out to the people that are still commenting on that video, comments that I've already written in 20 times already. People, That's the thing about YouTube commenters. commenters. They only react to the video, and they don't take a second to look if anyone else has already written their comment. Like it's, well, yeah, it's crazy. I'm not, and I'm not talking about recommendations, the recommendations you can do over and over because that just shows how much people love said thing. But when people are like, this is the reason why it was dubbed. It's like, oh, you're the 20th person to say that. Um, yeah, no. So we had so much fun with RRR that we wanted to watch, uh, uh, Bahu, is it Bahubali or Bahubali? Cause I think it's Bahubali. That's how they said it in the movie. Uh, I think I, Bahubali. Bahubali. I'm pretty Bahubali. sure it was Bahubali. Well, well it's, it's okay. either way, don't come at us for our pronunciation, okay? We are so white. And, isn't, it, and isn't it weird how white people are... Ignorance. Isn't it weird how, like, Americans are corrected on their pronunciation all the time? But how often do you correct foreigners on their pronunciation of English? And here's, here's the right answer to this. You can correct kindly and quickly. 100%. Oh, it's, it's actually, you know, quesadilla or whatever it is, like instead of quesadilla. The reverse no. never happens. But if you go to France right now and you go, uh, I'll take a, a croissant, they'll be like, croissant, croissant. And then you shoot them. And then you shoot them. If you're speaking or using a word that comes from another language or another part of the world and you mispronounce it, it's okay. It's really that's right. So, um, <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, that's that right. was that was my Bahu Bali. So, um, but this one was definitely recommended to us a million times over, and it's by the same director uh, as RRR. And yep. um, and yeah, I was excited to to do this with you. Um, another the one comment from the RRR video that stuck with me, the only one that ca- I cared about, and I never really got like confirmation from. Somebody said, I feel like Ryan didn't even watch the movie. <laughs> and so I watched the video back. I was like, why does this person? And it's, I think it's simply because I gave very like surface level reactions yeah. to, to you because you, yeah. you talked the most. Now I'm, I'm not saying that's a problem guys. That's just like a thing that I do. Like if I had Brando one, I'm going to talk with brando and i'm gonna let brando so so if it's a lot of it is just me reacting to what he's saying like it's just because (laughs) uh our zoom meetings are only 40 minutes at a time and i'm letting him speak we in the rrr comment comments uh section of the youtube we got this recommended to us a thousand times you got to watch bahubali one and two and so you and i talked about it and we were like you know what I want more RRR in my life. And if this is the Tollywood direction, this is where I want to go. So I watched this movie. Now, the first 15 minutes, uh, let's say 20 minutes of RRR is just so much fun. And it's, I was instantly in and ready to go. The first 20 minutes of Bahu Bali do not captivate in the same way. Um, this is what I'll say. I can tell that RRR wasn't the director's first movie. Do you know what I mean? Like you can, you can see where he came from in this movie. Like you can tell, like, this is just an earlier example of that director. Um, but I was so ready for another experience with Tollywood cinema because RRR was such a delight and I think this movie, just broad strokes, overall, still very enjoyable. But it's not as good as RRR. It, by miles, I'll say. I, I agree. I think it's a weaker whole. But at the same time, like as I'm watching this movie and as I'm digesting everything and as I'm coming to conclusions about how I feel about it, I know that it's the weaker film compared to yeah. RRR. I know that you sent me like some stuff about some of the technical issues that the director talked about. And like, I could tell that stuff too, but yeah. I also was trying to be like very disciplined. Like, look, I really don't know what I'm talking about because this is my second ever yes. in Indian film. And just the way that not every single American movie starts with the James Bond or Mission Impossible mission that That's you know right. they glues you to the seat. We have to give ourselves to the movie. I definitely you know saw a lot of the biblical stuff that I thought you would respond to, and I'm interested to hear you talk about all the parallels. I mean, I feel like you know I was watching Moses at the beginning. Um, okay, but um, I, I knew that I was honestly just trying to be excited and welcoming to what this movie was going to give me and not so much why it wasn't RRR. Yeah. But that's that's kind of the uh the precedent that's been set though. That it's definitely part of it. Yeah. But I but I so, didn't want it to be on my mind when I had a movie to watch for, you know, two and a half hours. Because sure. that would that'd be a long, miserable two and a half hours. So let's talk about what is in the water in India that's making these leading men so gosh darn delicious? I thought the lead actor in this movie, uh, Shivudu, Shiva, they call him a lot, um, or Bahubali, because I think he plays his dad he does. later on in the movie. And it so when I when that scene first happened, I am lost. I am like, wait, I thought he was, you know, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I think he's super handsome. The, the main, his main, like, uh, love interest in the movie, 
Avanthika. Please don't murder me for my uh, pronunciation. But uh, so he first sees her when she's like, you know, the butterfly lady. And uh, when she moved, her belly jiggled. And I was like, wow. Like this person is an in shape, thin person, but they've got some like jiggle on their tummy. What, what, it, you're, it, what you're suggesting is that she's a normal person. Yes. No, well, I, I, so I don't think that either. I think she's better than normal people. <laughs> I think she's much better. Well, what you're saying is that she was beautiful and felt real in the sense that, like, American cinema. Yeah, they would have hardened that up. And well, there was a scene in Wonder Woman 1984 where Gal Gadot. Uh, she was this pregnant, is, I think, during. Well, when she did this landing and her thigh jiggled, a bunch of people online were like, oh, my God, I feel seen for the first time. I'm like, you're not Gal Gadot. <laughs> like, because their thigh jiggle does not mean you get to relate with her. Um, but I do think, like, I just thought that was interesting. And I, me and my wife were watching this movie in the beginning, and she was like, wow, you know, she, that woman is absolutely gorgeous. And I was like, her belly jiggled. And my wife looked at me, and there's a joke we say that unattractive men, a lot of times when they're critiquing women, will be like, her nose is too big, you know, <laughs> for like uh, American uh, Miss America or whatever. They'll be like really critiquing women in a way that they don't do to men. And I was like, you're, you're absolutely right. And the fact that her belly jiggled. Now, I like a little jiggle on my bellies, okay? That's how I get down. And I thought that actress was so beautiful and um, I, I don't know. I just I appreciated seeing a real. And when I say real body, like there are real people that we know. Like if Ryan Uchi, your friend, bent over, he does his stomach doesn't roll. He, he just doesn't 0% have zero percent body fat. That's right. And he's a real person. And so is this person. I just thought it was it was a great considering how like visual the film industry is. Um. But that being said, she's absolutely gorgeous. Marry me. I'll leave Lulu tomorrow. Um, but uh, I thought she was beautiful. The songs in this movie took me out a little more than they did in RRR. Did you have that experience? I did. Uh, but I, that was one of the things that, like, I just felt like that was part of, like, what we knew we wanted was more matter-of-fact song yeah. and dance. Like, <laughs> That's the thing that, like, a lot of people talked about, too, about RRR. It's, like, it's about the translation and stuff. So, it's, like, I never want it to be fixed. Like, it's the translation. Yeah. It gets lost and, you know, reinterpreted. Oh, I never want that to be fixed. If that's Right. The, I mean, it makes me laugh. It's, it's almost as, like, comedic as, like, when you read subtitles for TV shows and it just tells you, like, when a horse whinnies. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank God we knew that. It just feels funny to me and i i mean i wish more music was matter of fact like that instead of all yeah. metaphorical and shit yeah i thought uh i thought overall it, it was a really fun experience um i enjoyed myself thoroughly it did feel a little longer than rrr felt um i don't think the pacing is as good in this movie but again i'm i'm critiquing art earlier art by the same artist after they've had a chance to kind of perfect it um, or, or get better at their craft. Uh, this movie, just like RRR, is very soap opera-y to where, like, there are close-ups on the face and, like, head turns. There were so many times when Shiva would, like, shake his wet hair, and I'm like, dear God. Like, I'm here for it, but how silly. Um, but in a good way. Like, these movies, I, like, I'm learning to go into them uh, just knowing that I'm going to have a good time uh, and not critiquing it in a way, like, like you talked about. Like, this is only the second Hollywood film I've ever seen. And it's another period piece. Like, you and I have now watched two Hollywood movies that are period pieces. Like, like we, we basically watched Gladiator and Braveheart. Uh you know, in, in terms of like American cinema, uh, comparisons. So I'd be interested to see what, uh, Tollywood take on 007 would even be with this movie. I felt 
more disconnected with the main character. Like he felt like he was more of a parody of himself than the previous characters in RRR did. And I think that like, that's actually going to be more of my experience. The further we go down these Hollywood movies, but like, again, a lot of like the head swift to camera and smiles. Like it was like this, like Prince charming thing. Yeah. Um, that like, I kind of just rolled my eyes out a little bit. Like I didn't feel a kinship to, to the main character. Um, honestly. And when he, he was pursuing uh, his uh, female counterpart. It was like a little weird and creepy, but also just like eye rolly, especially with like the song and dance number. Oh, like, yeah. it, like I couldn't quite figure out what was happening when he was like changing her, her wardrobe. Cause I was like, is he like stripping her <laughs> after like all that kind of stuff? It felt like weird to me. And I've, I don't think it was quite as bad as I initially thought as I was watching it, but like, <laughs> He just kind of like weirded me out a little bit, and yeah. uh, I didn't think he was like as awesome as I thought the other two characters were in RRR. So that right there, I didn't quite connect to to him as much. But you don't go around and change women's attire. No, I don't. Um, not Good touching man. that. Um, so when. <laughs> I'm also thinking about, oh, this is part one, the beginning. There's another part to this. And as we move along and we see, like, the epic climactic battle, and once we, like, start to understand, because the movie goes a long time without, like, going back to, oh, there's this kingdom and there's this river. And, like, I feel like a lot of the movie goes by without revisiting the setup um, so when we finally go back to the kingdom and filling in all of those blanks, I'm thinking to myself, structurally, this is all out of whack. And I think yeah. you, you mentioned the pacing and the structure of it. Cause I honestly feel like this movie should have just been the flashback. Yes. Like it it was kind of, it took over the second half of this movie anyway you easily could have just given us the entire setup given us that generational story the legacy story and then at the end of the movie focus all of our attention on uh on this main character that we have here and i feel like it still would have worked the exact same but the fact that we like jumbled so much and we did just simply see stuff that i wasn't frankly that interested in um I just kind of think like it was a mistake to not do that. Um, and the story was a little all over the place due to that. Yeah. And there's a lot of things in this movie that I think could have just been, you know, the whole beginning of the movie up, up till he meets her. Make that a, a montage. Make that a three minute montage. And then let's, let's, let's go. Um, so they spent weird amounts of time and like that whole scene. Yeah. Where he's like saying, Oh, you're ugly. I'm going to uh, put this powder on you now. And now you're pretty. Uh, I thought that was silly considering that she was some kind of warrior, um, and the mask and like, they, they just introduced a lot of things. There's a lot of like style over substance in this movie. Uh, and they don't always nail the style. <laughs> Like, there are a few scenes in this film where if you've done any kind of editing, you know that sometimes when they're, like, adding an adjustment layer to make, uh, you know, to change a LUT or to um, change the color grading of a particular scene, they'll throw an adjustment layer over and you start the adjustment layer where the scene starts. But there are several times in this movie where they missed it. And, it, and when it happens, it takes me out because, you know, uh, the other thing is like, if you thought some of the CG of the animals in RRR was a little like, well, that doesn't look quite real in this movie. If you thought if you needed them to put CGI on the screen when he's fighting that bull, you dumb because it doesn't it doesn't look like a real bull. And, uh, yeah, it just, it, 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 you can tell it's not real. So every time I saw CGI, I'm like, is, was this ripped from like 
a Divix, uh, you know, site or something? Or was this, you know, Pirates Bay? Like, what is happening? The thing about the visual effects is that the animals aren't going to bother me nearly as much as a bad composite. Sure. Because the animals, they're just part of the story. Yeah. So I get less caught up when the scene is about a man like running from a tiger or running from a a wolf because there's action and it's part of the story. But when I see bad composition and like half of the kingdom is lit in a deep purple and then all of a sudden there's a cutout of where it's like hot pink and it's like you just didn't blend that like and and it's okay like we're just kind of walking through all the stuff we saw but it was it's not the biggest deal but at the same time like that's what you texted me is that they talked about these incomplete visual effects and did we leave off with that what you read about did we leave uh with the understanding that part two looks way better or was it he was going to make sure that his next movies looked better yeah i think it was a time challenge more than anything uh the way the so basically the cinematographer, the AD, whoever, um, said that he was not happy with some of the CGI in Bahubali because uh, they just they, they missed some things. And I think had they had more time, they would have caught it. Um, but he was he was talking in preparation of two starting work on two. <clears throat> now, I don't know how long Tollywood has had cinema or budgets, but I think this movie's budget was $25 million in, you know, converted over to us dollars. And I think they made like 90 million or more at the box office with this. So they are doing a lot with a little $25 million for the scope of things in this film is crazy, right? Like, so for a $25 million budget, This movie looks exceptional and there are some problems, but for the most part, like the, the war, the battle scenes, like let's go when they're fighting that thing that the propeller blade thing that the, uh, his, uh, Bahubali's brother had amazing and like, you know, hitting that elephant, (laughs) which elephants have had it coming for a long time. And I'm finally glad someone put. Them I thought in their the place. elephant looked real. Yeah, it did to me too. I thought it looked really good, actually. That was the one time I was like, "Wait a minute, did they use CGI for this?" Yeah, I'm looking for the in the left corner to see if it. They may have just hit that elephant. We uh, that's right. Um, <laughs> you kind of left off before we had to create a new meeting. You were talking about the epicness and the scope and just basically we don't get movies like this over here, and. That's right. Again, the word that we talked about with RRR and the thing that we appreciate here, especially with these battle scenes, are creativity. Yes. Like the the enta- entire like the steps we went through to for that big reveal of like setting the red blankets on fire. Like every little bit of story that we got leading up to that point, I was like, what what are they doing? What's gonna happen? Yeah. And I'm constantly like anticipating how this is gonna be like just insanely creative and cool. So all of those little beats are fascinating. You talked about the like the gyro blade and all that kind of stuff is awesome. And I loved how that battle in particular was about two warring brothers that are kind of like, and I guess it's more so one brother fighting the other instead of them both fighting each other, but right. uh, um, while also fighting this enemy. So there's so many layers to what's going on and you're constantly excited of what's around the corner. Um, I think one moment that didn't work at all and almost took the entire air out of the battle is I understand the beat of, okay, now we have to feel like the enemy is winning a little bit. And they do this in the moment when they finally break through the wall of shields. Yeah. So we watch for about like 30 minutes. This um, Bahuba, like the team, the team that we're on, we're watching them whoop ass and be creative and <laughs> yeah. take out this army. And then there's the beat where they break through the line of shields and the tone of the battle in the movie instantly changes to, oh, we're fucking losing. That's right. And they didn't like really address and really show why that was the biggest deal in the world. Because when they set up the battle, there's actually three lines. Yeah. It's like they broke through the initial line and it's like, oh, this is game over. How are we going to? I'm like, 
I didn't really buy it, and I'm like, yeah. no, like you, you kind of just like needed this beat, but you didn't really earn it, <laughs> or right. or follow through. So I was just like, ah, okay, let's just get back to seeing awesome stuff because if I yeah. think too much about this, <laughs> um, I was like, but man, I love that they're swinging for the fences, though. It's like that friend that you have that they say, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I want to record this song. And then you show up and they're like, okay, I want like a string section. I want a choir. It's like, dude, we're, we're two dudes in this place right now. Like you're going to get an acoustic track and a vocal and that's it. But I love that with a small $25 million budget, they freaking swung for the fences. And I love that creative line because I do think like we, we could do all of this in cinema, like in the Marvel movies are the closest that we've gotten or, or maybe like Chronicle where the uh the superheroes are fighting in the in the air and doing all this amazing stuff we don't get real creative fight scenes like we get in tollywood cinema well, over also, here chronicle is a great example because chronicle the end fight scene the climactic fight scene takes place at night and a, a part of the cinematography is to hide that it's a visual effect Whereas right. what we've talked about too is that these movies, Tollywood movies, are so well lit, and that might be why some of the visual effects are harder to hide because they're not trying to. They want you to see everything in this grand scale, and they're yeah. not trying to hide it in shadows or color correction or you know they're not trying to hide it, and that's why I think some of the seams show a little bit more. But yeah. like, and I'm saying that to like give them more credit. Sure. I think, too, like, there are some scenes in this movie that rival scenes in RRR um, in terms of, like, uh, of, of, like, how beautifully shot they are and how the color correction is perfect. But then there were a few scenes that I think were recorded on, like, a flip phone. Like, the scene where, uh, what's his name? Katapu? Um... I just I just murdered that. Forgive me. His name is Katapa. The um, traitor? The yeah. old man traitor? Well, the spoilers, but yes. Uh the uh, the white beard guy. <clears throat> when he and Bahubali, when he's first like realizing who Bahubali is and he hits his knees and slides, like the far away shot in that, like the long shot, it looks terrible. And you can tell that that rain is, uh, you know, something they stole from Envato Elements. Like, it does not look good. And I'm wondering, like, there's a few times in this where I'm like, just leave it out, right? Like, you can you can tell that story without that long shot. Um, but there were a few shots that I would have edited out if it were me. But, again, overall, I think they're trying to pack. And I so much into one movie and I looked it up and it is like Tollywood films are three hours like typically that's what they go for so they're getting their money's worth out of it but I almost feel like when I was watching this that this could have been cut up and made like a Showtime show because it's every bit as good as like a, a Spartacus or I don't know if you ever watched that show but it's it's good um, but something like that if it was cut up and like put together differently this could have easily been a killer series um but again it's not that and we're so we're judging it on what it is i just it feels like they tried to put a season's worth of tv of stuff into one yeah i i didn't want to quite go there yet because when we talk about how much we appreciate this compared to like american storytelling like i know that there's a part two and I like was just thinking about how crazy of an idea it would be to in America put out and make a non franchise film and just know and promote that there's a part two. Like if imagine if Gladiator was Gladiator Part One and Gladiator Part Two and it was like another story. And like yeah. imagine if that was movies in America. I mean, that would be incredible. Like they were, if we were just so sure that this is just simply a great epic story, because we don't get epic films anymore. Like, dude, I, I I appreciate that so much, but yeah, 
that's a great example but again it's like ip you know it's like but sure they just came up with something and like were put in the work but um i think the thing that like the thing that i knew that like just because this is hollywood i'm not gonna let slide uh talking more about the structure and the pacing is that the fact that like and i know people in the comments already know they told me i get it indian cinema loves its song and dance numbers i respect that 100 percent but a flashback is not where you put another song and dance number. So the se- the second that the, the flashback and everything with the dad or whatever, once they do another song and dance number, I'm like, this ain't it. Like it, we had the one at the beginning. I didn't think it was good. We talked about how he's Again, yeah. changing her wardrobe and I didn't really care. For- but when they did another one in the flashback, I'm like, this is like, this is what primarily made me think this should have just been the movie. Like, it's like you want the movie to be the flashback because so much of what we did before this was just kind of like redundant, climb the mountain and yeah. redundant. The weirdest thing in this movie is when he creeps up on the girly and like paints her. Number one, that painting doesn't look great. But like, think about how weird it was to watch her lay. Like, it, it just felt forced. She laid down to take a nap. In a rock, hand in the water with a rock bed at, at like at a creek or a river or whatever, and put her hand perfectly in the water. And what the shot of him swimming up to it, I lost my shit. I thought yeah. it was so funny. And the fact that he's just painting underwater, and it's like, I don't know what this is. When he, when she's up in the tree and she's got the snake on the arrow, I thought that was sick, by the way. I thought that was going to come. I thought we were going to see that come full circle and we still might in part two, like just sending snakes on arrows. Like that's so sick. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing her, like him painting her shoulder during that, it's like, no, like stop. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the, the mere fact that you can't paint underwater, that's not how it works. Um, and the fact that he is like, uh, Ryan almost spit take. Uh, and then the fact that like, the painting looks like terrible and that he has them in some scenes and in other scenes, he just does. They just disappear. You know what? I'm actually going to give the movie the benefit of the doubt. How much funnier would it be if the paintings were like incredible? Right. They had to make what, what if they were like (laughs) piece, like intricate, like full blown, like Bob (laughs) Ross paintings. Yeah. Bob Ross. I love that. That's, that's who you pull out. Uh, no, and like the threesome uh, musical number where there's those three like, dear God, India, you are so beautiful. Um, but when they're when they're doing that dance scene, because I'm if, if I'm I might be incorrect here, so be easy on me, uh, film India. Uh, I don't I don't think that kissing is uh, very. Uh, normalized in India's Indian cinema yet, whatever. So, but there were a few scenes where he's like, you know, uh, uh, tracing her breast or like it would get like, like he licked her navel. Like the sex scene that they set up was still hot, but if they kissed, dear God, they would have burned the, the country to the ground. It, uh, let, and let's I, and just I, talk I, about how it's the most improbable couple of all time. Well, yeah. Like, the fact that, like, she instantly fell in love with him just because he essentially told her to. Like, that's what it is. Well, yeah. Because he's like, I, I've i been looking for you my entire life, and I climbed the mountain. And she's like, huh. Oh. I'd have been like, I didn't know you climbed the mountain. She wouldn't care at all if you watched anime. That's, <laughs> that's right. I no mean, nothing stop, nothing's stopping her from having that relationship. I mean, my God, that's all she needed to hear. Right. So... I'm just saying, I think India, like trying to realize it, realizing that it's such a different culture and the rules are just so very different. And I kind of think that's cool. Um, but I did pick up on something else. And this isn't only a problem in India, but it's a problem in American cinema where the darker skin tones are the bad guys. Did you notice that in this movie? Almost exclusively. Um, And I didn't see it. And then someone was like, well, even look at Lion King. And I'm like, it's animated. And they're like, yeah, but Scar is darker. And I was like, you know what? You're right. 
Yeah, I I think there's I know exactly like, what you're talking about, but I also think there's another aspect of play where like there's also this traditional storytelling element. And, ma- and maybe it's rooted from this and maybe sure. it just comes full circle, but it's like the white hat versus black hat cowboy. Yeah. Where it's like good and evil. And, and like you're a religious guy. Like you yeah. know that like whites symbolize like purity and you know. So I think I think there's a little bit of all of that kind of stuff. But sure. it's also, but also you're correct in what you're. Well, so me and my wife are also addicted to Indian matchmaking, on uh on Netflix, or Hulu, one of them, and they all talk about so and so. They can be a little dark or a little light. Like you want this honey brown skin, and I'm like, what is that like? To where lighter, they'll be like, get out of the sun. You're gonna get so dark. So. It, it, it's a problem. It's I think it's okay to say that like the caste system in India is not great, um, or like uh, judging people based on their on their the color of their skin is not great. And it it so hear me say this like this is an American problem too. I'm just calling it out wherever I see it because I'm hashtag woke. And uh, I did notice it in this movie that like the the bad army were almost in like blackface. They were just covered in like, you know, tar or whatever it was. Um, but again, I, I, I like forgive me if I'm ignorant about something that I don't know. But I did pick up on like all of the good guys are so fair complected and you know light skinned, and then the bad guys, supposed bad guys, are are dark complected. And it just it's interesting that that's. A universal thing. I don't know. You know, I know that British uh, occupied India, so I don't know where that all originates from. Because it probably could be. Is that like? I, I think that maybe I don't want to like say that there was any ill intent because maybe the intent was like, hey, we also just needed to look dynamic so that people right. know people know who's who. I mean, I do think you could accomplish that with like just different armor i mean look at game of thrones We're, we just see white people versus white people but yeah we know who's fighting who i mean unless uh-uh, the, no unless the dothraki what my wife can't tell the difference she's she's white people face blind so there are people like my wife who would have loved to see not that she's racist but would have loved to have seen like a different a more differing because they all just look like you know long-haired white people okay um fair enough um but yeah so but yeah, I know what you're pointing out, I and mean, I didn't. Yeah, I recognize it. Yeah, but again, this movie is good. I would call it a good film, a fun watch. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I said at the start. I mean, the fact that like I still am not used to this. Like this is all yeah. brand new to me. It's brand new to us, and the fact that like I can, I can know. I don't like this as much as RRR. I can point out yeah. more problems I have with it, but I'm still somehow willing to give myself to two and a half hours. Like, look, so there's this movie on Netflix this weekend called Day Shift with Jamie Foxx, and he plays a vampire hunter in the valley uh. in California. And I watched not even 30 minutes of it. And it wasn't, like, atrociously bad. I just knew, like, I just, I don't want to do this. I don't care. And I only gave myself 20 minutes of it. And for all I know, it's better than Bahubali or Bahubali. But, I I mean, I gave myself to a movie, like, five times over that just because it was new and fresh to me. And, again, I wish that American cinema looked like, it, everything feels like the fact that we can like explore kingdoms. You can't do that shit in American cinema. Like it's always like it's like rev our our history is so short lived that it's like oh we'll just do the Civil War or Revolutionary War. But it's not like there's like cool like elaborate beautiful kingdoms and like all this mythology that you can pull from historical. I know it's like historical fiction or maybe entirely fiction, but like but it's also like believable and it's yeah. also just fun to like transport yourself to another fun time and it's like you know we can only like go medieval and even then it's like not nearly as like i don't know magical in a way well i i've 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 drew a lot of parallels to this in like lord of the rings when they're in the fight scenes especially because 
<clears throat> the last time we saw American film attempt something like this was Lord of the Rings or uh, the Hobbit movies, whatever. Because um, you think about like the battle at Helm's Deep and this film's main battle scene. I enjoyed myself the exact same during both of them. And so the stakes felt high, even though we barely knew this other army existed. And, you know, the setup maybe wasn't the same, but the actual, like, uh, the the action of it or the, the entertainment value of the battle scenes were, you know, just as good. And the budget is, you know, not even a quarter probably of what those films were. Yeah. Um, well, I think that I'm glad that we're in agreement. You know, I, I, the three editing down the first half of the movie into like a little montage, I think would have been helpful. And then just focusing in tight, it can still be three hours. I'm not saying like, as is just cut, right? Like just give us more of the flashback. Uh, Um, uh, I think that definitely would have worked better, but, uh, overall I'm, I'm excited to see what comes next. Oh, I can't wait to watch the other one. I can't believe that it's even longer. Is it? Yeah. I think it's uh, like two four. I think it's two forty five. Well, when I typed in Bahubali into Google, almost exclusively the second one came up. Yeah, and, and so I think I there. Think- I think there's three different versions on Netflix. So I think it's. I think they do have like three, literally separated out based on like dub, sub. So I don't know. I'm gonna have to look into that. I saw several of them, but. Yeah, um, but I I cannot wait. I think Tollywood, at the Tollywood movies that I've seen so far, if I'm judging Tollywood on that, dear God, I am so excited to watch more. Um, all of your people are beautiful. Your storytelling is fun, even if like on the nose sometimes. Um, but man, I just I I it's it's so entertaining, fun, and good. So. Can't wait to see Bahut Bali too. Yeah, I don't know what the differences are. I, I see two versions of the beginning and then two versions of it's gotta be like a sub dub kind of thing. But anyway. Um Did you watch this one in Hindi? I, I you know what? I'm not sure. Okay. I watched the version I watched was in Hindi with subtitles. Uh I believe that that's how it was for me then. And so if there's a dubbed version, I will watch it only because we're not getting the original. Uh, what is the original language? Tagula, Tuluga, uh, Tam- Tulugu, uh, or Tamil. Uh, I probably killed both of those uh, pronunciations. But uh, since they're not in the original language they were recorded in, in the first place, I will watch the dub if one's available. If not, I'll watch, you know, whatever the most the biggest one is. Oh, so it's in Malayalam or Hindi. So mm. that's what that's what separates the two collections. So you can see both collections and yeah. So I believe I watched the Hindi one. Um also, yeah. I didn't know what Indian matchmaking was. I just opened Netflix and that is my featured on my homepage right now. Hell yeah. <laughs> I will not rest until all of my content is Indian. That <laughs> That's right. And the fans of Tollywood will cut you. They will cut you if you come after their their movies. And so we have to walk softly. It doesn't matter how much I celebrate and talk about them on my YouTube channel. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Um, well, I mean, I think we kind of said everything that we want to say, and we're anticipating part two. And if you're That's following right. along to what me and Brando are discussing, part two, I think we can have it done in a couple of weeks. I don't... I gotta... Um, there's a lot of, like lesser known movies that are coming out so they're not like big temple blockbusters you know summer's over but there is still like a lot of stuff coming out so i don't know when we'll get to part two but we'll do it asap that's right yeah do we have anything else no i love you i love you too uh i think that'll do it and i think that's going to be the end of this podcast um i'm going to see another movie after we get off here but i think that review is going to happen before so guys Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Letterboxd, at Rewatch Ryan. Again, everybody who's been 
uh, watching because of our coverage of uh, Tollywood. Uh, I love you. Thank you so much for supporting us. I hope yes. I hope you're enjoying our content. Um, I don't know how to read the culture all the time, and like, <laughs> uh, like I don't like maybe Bahubali is like more love than RRR. Like I don't know. Like who knows? I don't know. Yeah, tell us. I don't know what the temperature is on these things, uh, or maybe the comment section is going to agree with us 100% and then like talk about how much better the second one is. Like, who knows? I don't know how to read it. And I don't like do a whole lot of research. Uh, so <laughs> I want the just movie to speak for itself and then we can talk about. We barely even watch them. That's right. Um, so anyway, follow me on those places. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and you can see what me and Brando discuss when we get to part two. Brando Hall, can they find you anywhere? Don't look for me. I love you. Guys, thank you so much. Um, next week, I think we're going to talk about the beast, uh, Idris Elba versus a big ass lion. Um, and I, don't, I can't, whatever their movie comes out, but, uh, that's that. Um, guys, thank you. I'll see you on the next one.